So let's, um, let's kind of unpack that a little bit and sort of start with the idea that yes, exercise does increase circulating concentrations of the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG. Um, this increase is um, associated with, although it's very difficult to prove um, that it's causally related, but it's associated with some of the beneficial effects of exercise, including elevation in mood, reduction in anxiety, feelings of vigor, um, and so forth. So this kind of leads to the question, oh, and secondly, we know um, in studies that were done beginning um, about 10 years ago or so, that individuals with major depression have lower circulating endocannabinoid levels. So this sort of leads to the kind of logical idea that perhaps exercise, because it raises the endocannabinoid levels, may improve mood because of um, endocannabinoid restoration, let's say, in individuals with major depression. So this is obviously a really difficult um, thing to test in human beings, um, at least to causally prove, but the data we have so far really fit very nicely with this hypothesis. So um, a group that I'm associated with, led by Kelly Colton, who's an exercise physiologist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, has recently shown that in both normal individuals and in women with major depression, that exercise will elevate the endocannabinoids and that this is um, correlated with a reduction in the symptoms of depression and anxiety, at least for the first oh, half hour, maybe to an hour after the exercise. So it fits the idea that exercise elevating endocannabinoids might be part of the mechanism by which exercise actually um, is beneficial in major depression. Another interesting study that we just recently completed, though, um, suggests that individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, PTSD, may actually have a blunted endocannabinoid response. And we kind of speculate that maybe this is um, part of the etiology of the disorder. So in this study, uh, people with PTSD were put through an exercise regimen. And as opposed to normal healthy individuals, we saw that the endocannabinoids were not increased um, in those with PTSD, sort of suggesting that the whole endocannabinoid system, wherever it's coming from and winding up in the circulation, is somehow blunted in individuals with PTSD or an anxiety disorder. However, those with major depression do show an elevation, so it might be specific to that disorder. So in animal models, both are associated with symptoms of major depression. So you can, um, there's an animal model of depression where animals are put through um, unpredictable stressful situations day after day. And these animals develop reduced CB1 receptor expression, at least in the hippocampus, um, in their brains. So in that case, animals that have um, sort of depressive type phenotypes, so they don't seek out um, pleasurable activities like they won't drink sugar water anymore, for example. They do have reduced CB1 receptor expression. Now, doing that same kind of a study in people is very difficult, and honestly, the studies that have been done post-mortem, looking at CB1 receptor density in mostly in the prefrontal cortex, which could be the difference here, of people who died by suicide actually see an increase in the CB1 receptor um, expression. So it's very possible that uh, um, the changes that occur that are associated with depression, depressive symptoms may be different in different brain regions. What we can measure in people that are living 
um, are circulating endocannabinoids. So most of our data are really on the endocannabinoid side of the story, not so much on the um, receptor side of the story. One other very interesting piece of data that is out there, though, is that there was a, a study done um, looking at a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism in the gene for the CB1 receptor. Um, in people, comparing a cohort of individuals who um, were healthy to a cohort of individuals who had suffered severe early life abuse, negligence, um, uh, anyway, so who had suffered from early life abuse. And what they found is that individuals who had the rare um, allele in this part of the CB1 gene were pretty much protected from developing anhedonia or signs of depression um, in adulthood. So it suggests that maybe something about, again, the endocannabinoid CB1 receptor system participates in the development of depression, particularly in response to chronic stress, as may happen in early life um, abuse situations. And that if you happen to have the right genotype, um, maybe you are, um, you're protected from that development of depressive symptoms in later life. So coming at it from many different directions, sort of the body of evidence is suggesting that um, it may be both changes in the circulating or the, the ligand side of the story and the receptor side of the story that result in too little um, cannabinoid signaling um, in some brain regions, maybe too much endocannabinoid signaling in others, um, but a mismatch or let's, let's just say a dysregulation of endocannabinoid signaling could contribute to some of the symptoms of depression.